with uh, a bit of scripture. This is Psalm 73. And it's a very encouraging passage of Psalm. It says, uh, this is starting at verse 23, 73 verse 23. Yet I am always with you. You hold me by my right hand. You guide me with your counsel. And upward you take me into your glory. Whom have I in heaven but you? The earth has nothing I desire besides you. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Let's stand and, and praise God.
our soldiers fought it. And uh, maybe if you go ahead one, this is uh, the road along the supply line. Now, my grandfather in the First World War at this point in 1917 was a, a supply driver, so he drove rations and uh, ammunition and stuff back and forth uh, between the front line and the, the su supply stations farther back. So I'm just gonna, I'll, I'll start on Easter Sunday. They're, they're very short. Uh, this is April the 8th, Easter Sunday. Beautiful day. Judd uh, Bushy and Emory go forward uh, for El Ojo, the 9th, Monday the 9th. Uh, uh, today, Z, time, Z day, 0 time, 5.30 a.m., big advance. Dug forward position tonight. So trenches, dug forward trenches. The, uh, the 10th, move guns forward at daylight, showing up uh, snowing at intervals. The 11th, Wednesday, snowing today, slept in until noon then help swing brigade line, two parcels, I think that means two parcels uh, of equipment or whatever. Uh, the 12th, some snow this morning, established intermediate station B with Jim and Ryan, some dugouts are built. Friday the 13th, back to the battery for water and up to Thelius for wood uh, this afternoon. Uh, Wolverville entered by our patrols. So that must be a little village that they were advancing on. And then the 14th move from B to A station. Uh, good dugout received parcel from home. So we're going to zip ahead a little bit. That's, that was April the 14th. Now up to uh, April 25th, or May 25th. Uh, Pat killed in Norwich, wounded. The 26th. Down the horse lines for ball game. Gunners versus drivers. Bob slightly wounded. So there's there's ball games and things going on. They're trying to keep you know keep things half sane in the insanity. And move ahead to. August, uh, August 15th, Wednesday, over the top with lots of luck. So over the top means they were in the trenches, uh, an attack was ordered and they went out of the trenches over the top while being mowed at by machine guns and, and tried to take a forward position. And then finally, November, uh, let's start at November 5th. Moved to the Capitol this morning at 3 a.m. Laid a line uh, this afternoon. The 6th, boys went over the top at 6 a.m. and took Passchendaele.
our daughters, we uh, enjoy the freedom to come and go as we please, to say what our thoughts are, um, have freedom of speech, and uh, live in a free country. Sometimes we forget the price that was paid uh, by many for that freedom. So Father God, we, uh, we recognize all those who served and all those who gave the ultimate sacrifice for that freedom. May we never forget. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Heavenly Father, you are a great and powerful, magnificent and awesome God. You are all-powerful, all-knowing, creator of all. And uh, we are humbled in your presence, Lord God. Father God, you are the reason for our existence. Um, life has no purpose not for you, if it was not for you, Lord God. So, um, we're privileged that uh, you call us your children, that you care for us, that you uh, want to commune with us on a daily basis, on an hourly, uh, minute by minute basis. You're always there. Father God, we've uh, done things that are displeasing to you, and we want to come to you uh, with clean hearts. And so, by the power of the blood of Jesus Christ, we accept that. Uh, that mercy and that grace that you uh, provide for us. Father God, there are uh, uh, so many things to be thankful for. All that uh, you provided for us. Our uh, food, clothing, shelter, a free country to live in. And we're thankful for that, Lord God. Father, we... Uh, we ask that you would reach out to those in need and that we might uh, be your instruments of, uh, of that and that we might uh, minister to those in our community that are hurting, those that have lost, uh, those close to them, those that are suffering different afflictions, those who are tormented uh, emotionally and uh, just going through all kinds of pains in this world. Father, we ask for your peace and your comfort in all these situations. Guide and direct us this church and uh, lead, us, lead us forward into the coming months the way that you would have us go according to your will. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. So Lord God, uh, you provide us with so much and uh, we're thankful for that. And Father, we want to give back to you a portion of what you've given to us. It's really all yours, Lord God. And so we want to do that with joyful hearts that your kingdom might be built in this area, in this, in this country, in this world. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. As the offering is taken up, we're going to sing it.
Our Father and our God, we thank you so much that you remind us every week about your Son. And God, I pray that we remember every day why we wake up, why you allow us to be vertical to the ground so that we may let your light shine through us so that others may know the saving grace through your Son. We thank you for his body broken for us. We thank you for his blood poured out for the forgiveness of thin, sins. And God, we also thank you that he rose from the dead conquering death so that we too may conquer death and rise to be with you in heaven for eternity. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. On the night that he was betrayed, he took the bread and he broke it and said, Take eat. This is my body broken for you. And in the same way, he took the cup saying, This is my blood poured out for the forgiveness of your sins. Drink it. Psalm 73. That's um, what I got stuck on to preach from this week. Um, unfortunately, I couldn't find a video to show again. And um, you have to listen to me. Uh, appreciate Andy reading a passage from a part of Psalm 73. Um, the uh, seems to be really loud up here. Can you just turn the monitors off, uh, Anthony? Great. Um, he picked actually the only part of Psalm 73 that is encouraging. So um, Psalm 73 is written by a fellow by the name of Asaph. Uh, if he didn't write it, he at least sang it. And so who Asaph is, is uh, he's a guy who was a music minister for King David. Okay, so there's about a dozen or so psalms that are attributed to Asaph. And so uh, what we know about Asaph is that um, he was a godly man who served God faithfully. He hated injustice. And one of the recurring themes in all of the psalms that he wrote is that he wanted people to keep, keep their eyes fixed on God and God of things. But what I really got stuck on in Psalm 73 is the honesty. Sometimes you read scripture and it's over the top. Everything is wonderful. The guy, especially in Psalms, they'll sing about the praises and how wonderful it is. But Asaph is completely honest about his own confusion and frustration in troubled times. So, please bear with me as I read all 28 verses of Psalm 73. Now, the encouraging thing for you guys is typically a long passage means a short sermon, okay? So, Psalm 73. And I'm reading from the New Century Version. God is truly good to Israel, to those who have pure hearts. But I had almost stopped believing, I had almost lost my faith, because I was jealous of proud people. I saw wicked people doing well. They are not suffering, they are healthy and strong. They don't have troubles like the rest of us, they don't have problems like other people. They wear pride like a necklace, and they put on violence as their clothing. They are looking for profits and do not control their selfish desires. They make fun of others and speak evil. Proudly, they speak of hurting others. They brag to the sky. They say that they own the earth. So their people turn to them and give them whatever they want. They say, how can God know? What does God most high know? These people are wicked, yet always at ease and getting richer. And Asaph asks the question, so why have I kept my heart pure? Why have I kept my hands from doing wrong? I have suffered all day long. I've been punished every morning. God, if I had decided to talk like this, I would have let your people down. I tried to understand all of this, all of what he saw, but it was too hard for me. 
until I went to the temple of God. Then I understood what will happen to them, speaking about the wicked. You have put them in danger. You caused them to be destroyed. They are destroyed in a moment. They are swept away by terrors. They will be like waking from a dream. Lord, when you rise up, they will disappear. When my heart was sad and I was angry, I was senseless and stupid. I acted like an animal towards you. But I am always with you. You have held my hand. You guide me with your advice, and later you will receive me in honor. I have no one in heaven but you. I would want nothing on earth besides you. My body and my mind may become weak, but God is my strength. He is mine forever. Those who are far from God will die. You destroy those who are unfaithful. But I am close to God, and that is good. The Lord is my protection. I will tell of all you have done. So nothing like a uh, encouraging word from scripture to get us pumped up. I want to tell you a story about um, uh, six, six blind men who were getting a tour of a zoo. And so um, the guy doing the tour, he wanted to, you may have heard this story before, but he wanted them to experience um, what an elephant was like. Obviously being blind, they'd never seen one before, so he let them go up and touch it. So the first guy goes up and he grabs onto the tail and he goes, oh, an elephant is like a rope, a big long rope. And the next guy, he goes to walk up and he grabs on to, to the leg and he goes, no, it's, I've never seen a rope this big. No, an elephant is like a big tree or a log. And the third guy walks up and walks right into the side of an elephant, of the elephant. And he said, no, no, an elephant is like a wall. The uh, fourth guy, he goes and he happens to grab onto the elephant's ear and, and it must have tickled because the elephant you know, fluttered away and he goes, oh, he said, no, an elephant is like a fan. The fifth guy grabbed onto the tusk and he goes, oh no, it's not a fan. He says, it's like a, a giant sword. And the sixth guy, he grabbed onto the trunk. And as he grabbed onto the trunk, the elephant raised it. And he goes, oh, he said, no, I'm confused. He said, an elephant is like a snake. Each from their own perspective, they saw different things. And that is how Asaph was confused. At the first, the first part of this psalm, he states, because he knows and he's been taught, God is good. God is good to those who are pure in heart, to those who follow after him. And the challenge that we face, and we've talked about this in our Sunday school class and in our um, Bible study the last uh, you know, several weeks, what do we see as good? Well, we live right here, right in the physical. So when we think of God is good, we think God is good in this life. God is good to those who follow after him in this life. And so the um, challenge for Asaph is that didn't compute. Um, a show that uh, Lori and I watch uh, Saturday mornings when we're making waffles or pancakes or having our coffee and Saturday mornings we watch show after show after show, but this is Beachfront Bargain Hunt. Anybody else watch that show? Okay, yeah. Basically, it's about people who, uh, you know, they save their money and, and they want to get kind of like a retirement place or a place they can travel to down south, um, you know, for a bargain. You don't have to be a millionaire to have a beachfront property in Dominican Republic or Florida or whatever. Because the reason why they do that is they want to relax, enjoy life, we're all after the good, easy, carefree life. Not that there's anything wrong with getting a beachfront bargain. But that's what people want. They want a good, easy, carefree life. No troubles. No commitments. 
If you don't love your job, you wish away five days for two. How does that ever make sense? Asaph's experience in life appeared to contradict his knowledge and belief about God. Psalm 73, 3. I was jealous of proud people. And he almost, he almost stumbled. It says here he almost lost his faith. I was jealous of proud people. Why was he jealous? Because he saw them doing well. They're not suffering. They're healthy, strong. They don't have troubles like the rest of us. They don't have problems like other people. Why does it seem at times in our short-sightedness that we look at others and we think of ourselves? Look at those people. They have it easy. They have no worries. And then we feel sorry for ourselves. In fact, we see some people as not just doing okay. They seem to be doing very well. And not only that, when they die, they slip into eternity quite peacefully. Some people. So Asaph asks, why should he keep his heart pure? Why follow after God? Asaph learned the truth about God, but I repeat, he had learned what he had learned did not go along with his experience. As a result, he was confused about several things. And I um, appreciate that he writes about that. What are the things he's confused about? He's confused about the prosperity of the sinner, or those inside of God. Verse 3. He's confused. We talk about if you follow after Jesus, you're going to have peace. Well, why does it seem that people have peace without God? That confused him. The pleasure of the sinner. He was astounded that. People can live such lives of sin with no trouble, and the good times keep rolling on and on and on. And then the pride. In our Sunday school class, we talked about pride being, you know, the, the original sin, right? Satan fell from heaven because of pride. Adam and Eve, they didn't believe God, that God would take care of them, so they had to take matters into their own hands. and also the progress. And what did this do to Asaph? What this did, let me read here. Um, it caused him to become bitter in his heart. This is what the wicked are like. Always carefree and they increase in their wealth. Surely in vain I have kept my heart, heart pure. In vain I have washed my hands of innocence. He felt pretty sorry for himself, but one thing Asaph didn't do, he didn't talk about this. He was smart enough to know that if he just wallowed in his own sins and uh, his own feeling sorry for himself and talked to others about it, he would be dragging them down into the same pit that he is Right? He says right there, he said, If I had said, I will speak thus, I would have betrayed your children. He's talking about, obviously, at that point, the Israelites. But how often or not do we feel sorry about ourselves, focus on ourselves, and uh, what's the saying? Misery what? Misery? Love. Misery loves company. And do you feel better? No. When Asaph, saw, when Asaph saw these things, he had thought he had actually wasted his time. How many of us has, have truly felt that way? When trials, tough times come up, how many of us are tempted to think that we'd be better off living like the rest of the world, that there's no benefit in serving the Lord? Don't be tricked. Don't be caught. Don't get caught looking at life from this perspective. Asaph's heart and mind tricked him. Basically, what he perceived around him in the physical life made him sad. It made him act no different than an animal towards God. In verse 22, he said, um, When my heart was grieved and my spirit embittered, I was senseless and ignorant. 
I was a brute beast before you. In the um, MCV version, it says, when my heart was sad and I was angry, I was senseless and stupid. I acted like an animal towards you. Make no mistake about it, the battle that we fight is not in this physical realm. The battle we fight is not sex, drugs, and all of that stuff, whatever you want to put in that box. The battle we fight is here, in your mind. Philippians 4, 6 through 8. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Paul doesn't write there that he's going to guard your life. He doesn't write there that your life's going to be easy and your troubles are going to go away. He writes, you want to guard your heart and your mind. Because, thank goodness, we're getting a new body and a new earth. Uh, you know, a new, new earth. I'm not going to have to look at this rag for eternity. So, he's not really concerned about this body. He's concerned about your mind and your heart. Sin isn't conceived in your perception of life around you. It's, perceived, it's conceived in your mind. And then he writes, Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, what does he tell us to do? Anyone? Dwell on those things? Think about such things. Uh, a few weeks ago, I'm kind of like the fellow that, that uh, we showed a video here a month or so ago that ran the um, half marathon. He said, you're going to if I'm going to do that, I'm going to work it into a sermon. Well, Lori and I ran a half marathon about a month ago. And um, it was the most interesting two and a half hours of my entire life. It was on our bucket list. We're in PEI, the PEI half marathon. It's on our bucket list, so um, anybody know a half marathon is 21.1 kilometers, just shy of 21.1 kilometers? That's about 27,852 steps. Not that anybody's counting. Uh, our next on our bucket list is actually we're going to do a marathon next year. But um, I want to, we're talking about guarding your heart and mind, so I don't want you to get crazy thoughts about doing a marathon, because uh, it is crazy. If you ask Lori or I, and you can ask her, or Ian is a great example. Running a long race is part physical and mostly mental. Don't get me wrong, you have to train and practice if you're going to run 21.1 kilometers or 27,852 steps to cross the finish line. But part of that is having your mind focused. And, and I want to share something that happened to me during that race that never ever happened to me ever before running. Uh, people have talked about that you hit a wall, right? You're running and you hit a wall and you just want to stop. You just, you'll sit down right there and that's it. Stick a fork in me, Jerry, I am done. Never happened to me before. So you, you think after two hours and 20 odd minutes of running, when you're almost done, and and really, I looked at my phone, I was at kilometer 20, and I was going to sit down on the side of the road, and that's it. I am done. I was not going to finish. And so, then the argument started. And if you ask uh, Lori about it, we ran the whole thing together. Quite literally, the argument started. I was talking to myself out loud. Arguing. Come on, Mark, you're going to finish. No, I am done. No, come on, you only got one, one kilometer left. Like like a schizophrenic, right? <laughs> Two hours and 20 minutes, and I only had about seven minutes left to go, and I had a battle raging in my mind. 
It did finish. But that's where all your spiritual battles are fought, in your mind. When you make a decision, when you make a decision, all you have to do in the physical world is stick to it. Where we trip up is we're trying to make decisions on the fly. If we didn't train to run a half marathon, you know, and we had a certain we were going to run 10 minutes and you, you walk for a minute and you, you do this, you do your training, all you have to do is do your training. And that's like the Christian life. You just do what you're trained to do. And you do it over and you decide to do it again and you decide to do it again until you get to the end. So the second half of this psalm, quite, quite literally, the tone, if you are still awake, okay, if not, I'll wake you up here in about five minutes. If you're still awake, around verse 17, the tone changes in Psalm 73. Well, we'll start at verse 16. Asaph says, when I tried to understand all this, everything that he had seen about the wicked doing great, it was oppressive to me until I entered the sanctuary of God. Then I understood their final destiny. Um, Asaph spent time with God. He begins to see the reality. And I think even as a church sometimes we forget the reality. It's not just about bringing people to sit in pews on Sunday morning. You know, how many are here on Sunday morning? It's more about how many people are not going to hell. Because that's the final destiny. It's one or the other. If you, if you believe, it's one or the other. There are two things that Asaph saw. He saw the true destiny of the wicked in verses 17 and 18. We can be jealous over the lives of the unsaved person, but this life is the only heaven that they'll know. You ever think of it that way? It's the... I would have to have so much Ciprolex if that's, if that's what I believe, that this was it. I'm dead serious. I'm an absolute basket case. I am now, and it's not what I believe. But isn't that sad? The other thing that Asaph realized was how foolish his thoughts were. His earthly senses tricked him. He acted no different than an animal following his instincts. We've all had times and been guilty of being like Asaph, getting discouraged and confused, thinking that we are in this alone. I know I've said this, so I'm sure I can't be the only one, and stay with me, because I'll be depressed if nobody agrees with me. We've all said things like, God doesn't care, God doesn't hear, or God isn't here with us. Verse 17 is the key. When Asaph communed with God, things became clearer for him. When he took a breath and he thought about things from a he heavenly perspective and not an earthly perspective, it became very clear to him. The passage I read from Colossians 3.2, set your mind on things above and not on earthly things. This is what Asaph realized. And this is what Andy read at the beginning of the service. But I am always with you. You have held my hand. Verse 24. You guide me with your advice. And later you will receive me in honor. I have no one in heaven but you. I want nothing on earth besides you. My body and my mind may become weak. But God is my strength. He is mine forever. Don't fall into the trap of looking at things the wrong way. Don't be like the blind men who are only seeing the elephant from one perspective. I'm sure we have some Asaphs here today. I'm sure there's people in this room that feel like giving up from time to time because of the load that you carry in your life. The challenge for you this morning is to do what Asaph did communion with God. If you're not a Christian, then that's your 
first decision you need to make. First you decide, does God exist? If you decide he exists, then you have to decide, realize that he wants a relationship with you. And it goes from there. Relationship through how? Through his son. The goal is that he gives you his eyes so that you can look at things his way. Everything that happens in this life, I feel like I'm a broken record. For those of you who don't know what a record is, it's a vinyl disc <laughs> that we used to have a needle on it and all the sounds used to come through the needle and you'd get it, you know, you take it and you toss it aside, you get a scratch on it and then it would go over and over and, you know, skip. Skipping is like, okay, you have a CD and you get a scratch on it. Except on a record, it would actually repeat. The CD stops playing. Okay? Thank you, technology. Anyway, this life is temporary. Crap happens. And I've cleaned that up for you guys. It is Sunday morning and we are in church. But crap happens in this life. It's temporary, it passes. But what we need to focus on is what happens beyond this. 80 years in this life is not even a flick in eternity. We want him to have, we want to have his eyes so that he can look at things his way. <coughs> you need to get to the place where you can say just like Asaph did, God is my strength, he is mine forever. Let's pray. Our Father and our God, the English language does not even begin to express our gratitude in your desire to have a relationship with us. And God, we thank you so much that you gave us minds to think and make decisions on our own. We pray, Father, that when we look at all the options, look at all the information, look at all what you've laid before us, that we come to the conclusion, Father, that you love us, you want a relationship with us, and most of all, Father, you want us to get over ourselves in this life. Eternity and everything you want for us is bigger than us. We need to stop feeling sorry for ourselves because we know, Father, that because you created us, we have value and that you want us to run the race, to know our training, to get to the end, to get to the finish. We thank you for your son, and God, I pray for those who have not made a decision for you that uh, at some point they will while they still have breath in their lungs. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand.
from Jude 24. To him who is able to keep you from falling and present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy. To the only God our Savior be glory, majesty, power, and authority through Jesus Christ our Lord before all ages, now and forevermore. Amen. <laughs>